Welcome to Military Faith and Spiritual Resilience. This is Elizabeth Fulgaro. With me today is Erin Nichols, nutrition and fitness coach and Gold Star wife. Hi, Erin. Hi, Elizabeth. At the end of our last episode, you were sharing about a deployment mode, that space that as a spouse you had to get into emotionally in order to cope with the stresses of having your husband deployed to Iraq. Do the ones deployed also experience something like that? And is it the same or is it different? I think it's very different because they have a job to do. So that's what they're focused on. And kind of the way I saw it, the way the way I came to see it and, and got better at it as time went on was I needed to be able to put my head down and focus on something as well. So he had his job to do there. And I had my job to do at home, which was basically to keep myself together. And that usually meant just keep myself busy and focused on me. Earlier on, we had talked about Sam and Aaron. Yes. As one word, becoming Sam and Aaron. And because we had very much grown up together, became adults together, there was a lot that I still didn't, there was, there was still a lack of separateness in me, like, what do I actually like? And so that time apart allowed me to just kind of figure out like, oh, I like this thing or whatever. I enjoy watching American Idol with his mom and he would never watch American Idol or something like that. So there was that kind of independence part of it on on my side and then just like a focus on whatever the things were that I was doing and for him, I don't think the emotional detachment, though, that I was talking about was necessarily there. It was just a focus on work and being in the moment. And at least for him, I can't speak for anyone else, any other, you know, wife or any other troop who's deployed. But I really didn't get that sense from him that there was anything emotionally different. For me, there was a big emotional different difference because I was putting up that wall of, of protection. To protect your heart. Right. Because he had to be away. So he's away, mm -hmm. seven months. Mm -hmm. You hadn't really been apart that long before, and the separations before had been difficult, and you learned to build these emotional walls to survive. But now he comes back. What does reunification look like? I was a ball of emotions. Similar, actually, his boot camp graduation, too. I was a, an, an emotional wreck. But the biggest thing is I just would hear people come back from more different. And yes. what did that look like? I knew he'd seen combat. It wasn't like he was there sitting in office for seven months. Um, he had seen stuff. And I didn't know what that was going to mean for his personality, for our relationship, anything like that. And especially because you know, we were hardly able to talk on the phone. You know, we wrote letters to each other, but we hadn't seen each other for seven months. And significant things had happened in his life, you know, that he had seen that I wasn't a part of. And so I was really nervous about just like, what was he going to be like more long-term? Was there going to be PTSD? What was that going to look like? And then even just like imagining the moment of like seeing each other for the first time, it got me, it got me nervous in kind of a bad way, but then also like really excited in like butterflies too. So a lot of different emotions. Yeah. Like a ball, like, like all tangled up together. Yeah. And like most things, I made more of it in my head than I needed to. Okay. So what did it look like when reunification came? It was great. Oh, awesome. <laughs> we were, That's great. Yeah, we were, um, it, it reminded me a little bit of like boot camp graduation as where all the families are like kind of sitting there on the sidelines waiting. There's a big like asphalt area. They would fly into Riverside and then be bused back down to Camp Pendleton. There's an old closed down uh, Air Force Base, March Air Force Base where they would fly into. And so then we're like waiting for the buses to get there. And then there was a brief kind of, you know, the commander gets up and talks and whatever, and nobody's listening what the commander has to say until like you're dismissed. And then 
you know, you go and you find your people. And so I just remember seeing each other and, you know, wrapping each other in our arms. And then it was like, poof, back to normal. Wow. It was, it was just like, it was that fast. It was, there, 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 there wasn't like a having to getting to know, get it, get to know each other again. It just felt, it was Sam and Aaron. Oh, very nice. Uh, instantly. So the things that we did have to do kind of initially was he hadn't driven for seven months. And every time he <laughs> was in a vehicle, he was scouring the landscape for anything that might be an IED. And other personal vehicles couldn't be within 100 meters. So we kind of decided, let's give it a couple weeks before you drive. Oh, like, yes. Get like reacclimated to having vehicles next to you, seeing a paper bag on the sidewalk um, as the passenger before you get in the driver's seat. And that was a really good decision. It sounds um, like it. Yeah. And because I remember there was specifically one time we were we were going down Oceanside Boulevard and there's a bus stop right there and there was a paper bag that was like on the ground next to the, you know, it probably had a liquor bottle in it or something like that next to the bus stop bench. And he has this immediate like instinct to, I don't know what he would have done, but his, he's, his immediate thought is IED. Sure. Sure. So did you notice any other changes in Sam? Definitely. He had, not with me, but with work, he had a lot of anger that he didn't have before. Wow. A lot of anger and frustration and problem sleeping. And you said the anger was related to his work? Yeah. So we would we always had one car because he would be gone for seven months. Sure. And then whenever he was stateside, I just drove him to and from work. I didn't want to continue. I didn't want to contribute to our lack of time together. So I didn't want to have a job uh, as well. And so when I would pick him up from work is 15 miles from our apartment to where he was on base. So one way. So we had a 15 mile drive back home. And it would be him like venting and unloading his frustration from the day. And never, never with me. I mean, you there there was like a like a palpable like <sighs> when he got in the car. Um, and then hopefully he would get most of that out in the drive home before we got home. And then usually uh he would go take a shower and I would start dinner. And then kind of the evening was really like I came like I became like a de-escalation therapist or something because the evening was basically like trying to get him to like calm down um and just be able to relax because he it was like he was never able to just get into like that relaxed state that hypervigilance yes. had remained but the circumstances were different so you know we went um we got him like a, a supplement called calm we would drink chamomile tea in the evening. Um, I mean, I literally would like, was, was like consciously talking like quieter and slower than normal. Um, and was always just trying to be very like reassuring of like, this is what we're going to go, we're going to do, you know, we're going to have this for dinner. Go take a shower. We'll watch reruns of Everybody Loves Raymond. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, and that was just kind of like this routine that we got into. And it probably took most of that seven months before that next deployment, um, before he was kind of okay. Um, agoraphobia was a big one too, uh, and claustrophobia, actually. So those were, those were new. So on the weekends, we would usually, Saturday or Sunday or both days, we would take a shower together in the morning and... Um, Every now and then, he would just, like, have an absolute panic attack. He'd be like, move, move, I have to rinse off, and he'd have to get out. And then, like, once he was out, he was okay, but, you know, he's with his wife in his shower in his apartment, and it was just, it would just come over him, and he just had to get out. 
Um, and then with crowds too, like we came, we went home for Christmas and, you know, whenever you come home from the military, like back to your hometown, it's exhausting because you have to go and make, make the rounds and see everybody, or there's like big gatherings or, you know, so everybody can come and see him. And so we had, you know, two or three different Christmas things we were doing and just nothing was like rowdy, but just because there's so many different groups of people talking in a house, it was just kind of loud for him and a little bit overwhelming. And so he would just like disappear. And sometimes he would go outside and take a short walk or depending on like whose house we were at, he would go upstairs um, or whatever and just try to like separate himself uh, and kind of regather himself. And nobody else really saw this. I, I saw it. Um, and then one time we went to SeaWorld, um, and I, I don't know if they still do this, but back then SeaWorld, um, all, all the Anheuser-Busch parks would give like once a year active duty and I think up to four dependents would get free admission. And so we usually went to SeaWorld once a year and that time, you know, however long it was after that deployment, we went to go and it was probably the least amount of people we'd ever seen there. And we were there for maybe 45 minutes. And he was like, I can't do this. I have, we have to go. And just, that was it. What was it about the numbers of people? Was it the escalation of the sound? Or were there other things with the hypervigilance? I think it was probably the hypervigilance because it, I don't remember SeaWorld being loud. I mean, you're outside, you know, and, and, you know, everything is really, really spread out. Um, You know, I mean, they have like a huge tram that goes across the park. It's, it's an enormous um, property. And yeah, like I was saying, it was like the least amount of people we'd ever seen there, but just something about that day, whatever it was, he couldn't handle it. Um, There were other times like we went to Ikea and he was fine. I mean, Ikea's like a maze. Like, if you're going to feel claust- yes. claustrophobic <laughs> anywhere, Ikea would be the place. But, you know, we went there and he was fine. Um, uh, so it just kind of it just kind of depended. Just like sometimes, you know, the shower, no big deal. Otherwise, we, w- we wouldn't have kept doing it. Um, but it was a, just a few times that was just it just hit him. And he would have to escape, basically. So unpredictable. Yeah. So you said, so seven months away, seven months home, Mm -hmm. and then a redeployment? Yeah. So his second deployment was called a MU, Marine Expeditionary Unit, where the Marines go out on ships with the Navy. So their home port was in Okinawa, Japan, and they went to Guam, the Philippines, Thailand, and Japan. Uh, So that, that was another... Another seven months, and that time, you know, it was be a little bit becoming old hat. Okay. You know, got this, back into deployment mode, okay? That time I ended up living with his mom, and uh, right before that deployment, actually, his parents split up. And so it was kind of like my brother-in-law, Donnie, got custody of dad, and I got custody of mom. Oh, awesome. um, <laughs> okay. And he and I were like the go-between, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, we still hung out as we had done before. Um, but it was like, yeah, like we were envoys for the, you know, parental parties. Um, so, yeah, I went back into deployment mode, basically. And so that time around, I went back to work at the country club where we had all worked before. Uh, Donnie actually ended up maybe halfway through that deployment getting rehired and, and starting. So we worked together um, again. And then I was going to school and I was going to the gym. And I had a really, I had a pretty a pretty tight schedule. And my life was, was work, school, gym. Um, because of my school schedule, that gave me good routine. And so my school schedule determined my work schedule. And then when I wasn't at school when I was at, or work, I was at the gym. And that was the first time I really got into fitness. I was, I was always athletic. I was just, I was running around. I had a ball in my hand all the time growing up. But, you know, as a late teenager, early twenties, I had 
just well, I, I fell in love. I found it. I found another hobby, um, <laughs> and so during this deployment, um, I had I had just actually started to work out again before that deployment um, at Camp Pendleton, and you had a personal trainer there, and they did the body fat testing and all that stuff, and I was like thirty three percent body fat, which I didn't like, and um, and I was I was maybe a little bit overweight, but I was mostly over fat than I was overweight. Um, and so that was my goal during, I was like, all right, straight A's, save a bunch of money and get lean. And I dropped, I basically halved my body fat percentage in seven months. Um, I was like 16% body fat when he came home. Um, which is, I think still the leanest I've ever, I've ever been. <laughs> I definitely have a lot more muscle and I'm, I'm in, in much better shape in general now than I was then. Um, and I know how to do it the right way now as well, but that was my focus. And I was, that deployment went much more smoothly because, you know, it was the second go around and I was, I, I knew to create that routine, create that focus. And were, were the walls the same then or were they different? They were still there. They were definitely still there. I think I was... I was less afraid of the ending yeah, before okay. because we'd had mm-hmm. that reunification and it, yeah. and it it went great. And so I wasn't really worried about that again. He also wasn't going to war this time. Yes. So that made a big difference. They ended up doing some uh, humanitarian relief during that deployment. I was actually at work at the country club and walking through the grill area and they have the TVs on and some news channel was on and they said there's this massive... Uh, there's this earthquake that caused this massive mudslide in um, on one of the Philippine islands, Leyte. And they said there's a Marine unit nearby that is redirecting to go provide humanitarian aid. And I was like, that's Sam. Because I knew their itinerary and that's what they're supposed to be doing. They were gonna go they were gonna go do work with the Philippine Marines. And so uh, sure enough, the next day I got word through the chain of command, that that is indeed what they were doing. The Marines cross-decked. They went from one ship to another. The other two ships went on to, to go do the training, I guess, with the Philippine Marines. And then the, the ship he cross-decked to, they went and spent, I think, four days there um, helping clear roads and things like that. Um, and he said it was the most miserable four days of his life. Oh, my goodness. Very nice that he did it, though. But... Hard work. Yeah. So can we continue talking next time? Absolutely. Thank you, Erin.